Things, Aerospace and Cyber 2020 attendees. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our special virtual Aerospace and Cyber Aerospace Nation panel entitled An Effects-Based Approach to Force Structure Decisions. By way of background for this panel, myself and Doug Berkey at the Mitchell Institute recently pu published a piece on this topic entitled Resolving America's Defense Strategy Resource Mismatch, the Case for Cost Per Effect Analysis. Recognizing the budget realities driven by COVID-19 and a persisting strategy resource mismatch that's particularly disadvantageous, disadvantageous for the Air Force, this paper advocates for using what we call a cost per effect approach for assessing procurement initiatives and making force management decisions. Existing decision metrics rely heavily on what you all are familiar with, and that's unit costs and costs per flying hour, which are essentially ineffective in truly predicting the real world value of modern hardware and combat. Assessment methods need to evolve to take into account new operating concepts like JADC2, ABMS, Mosaic Warfare, as well as the advantages of fifth generation aircraft and new spacecraft, all of which will see assets working together in a highly dynamic fashion to achieve Air Force operational goals. Now, given the scale of necessary recapitalization in the Department of Defense, particularly for the Air Force, the business management approaches that drive the Department of Defense need some serious modification to refocus on combat effectiveness not simply cost. I thought that the best way to explain this cost per effect model is with an example. So let me give you a short one. On the first night of Operation Desert Storm, the first conventional air attack against one target, Shiba Airfield, required a force package of 41 aircraft of which only eight dropped bombs. These eight non-stealth strikers required multiple escort aircraft to jam hostile air defense radars, suppress surface to air missile threats, and counter potential enemy fighters. At the exact same time, we've got 20 F-117s striking 28 separate targets. Their stealth design gave them the ability to penetrate enemy air defenses without the need to rely on a large number of escort aircraft to provide defensive support. Moreover, precision strike technology allowed the F-117s to hit their targets with great lethality. In other words, they use only one or two bombs per target. So while each legacy non-stealth strike aircraft was less expensive from a unit cost perspective than a stealth F-117, the fact that it took so many of them and a large package of supporting aircraft to accomplish a single task drove exceedingly high real-world operational costs. If you do the math, one stealthy F-117 was the equivalent of 19 non-stealth aircraft. Additionally, the significantly larger number of associated air crews, sustainment costs, logistics support, and basing requirements for such a large enterprise substantially drove up total costs. The F-117s, by comparison, yielded superior mission value during Desert Storm by flying less than 2% of the air campaign's total combat sorties, but striking over 40% of the fixed targets in that campaign. A point of making not the system itself, but the system's capabilities, the metric by which the Air Force prioritizes programs and wields its budget authority is to ensure that our force is the most effective and efficient that it can be. And frankly, these comparative assessments should also apply in a joint mission context. Too often, they're only made within service stovepipes. Funding will likely go down over the next um, five-year defense plan, and mission demand will only rise. From a warfighting perspective, America needs to get the most out of every dollar spent. So with that bit of a background, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Lieutenant Generals Dave Nahum, Clint Hynote, Bill LaCorey, and Dr. Bill LaPlante, who will provide their perspectives and insights on this topic. Before I get them, turn it over to them, let me give you just a brief background on each one. 
Lieutenant General Nahum is a command pilot with more than 3,400 hours and is currently Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs at Headquarters Air Force, where he leads the development and integration of the Air Force's resource allocation plans. Lieutenant General Clint Hynode is also a command pilot with more than 2,000 hours and currently Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategy Integration and Requirements at Headquarters USAF as well where he's responsible for developing Air Force strategy and multi-domain operating concepts. Lieutenant General Bill LaCorey Jr., who as Director of Strategic Requirements, Architectures and Analysis at United States Space Force Headquarters, is responsible for developing strategy, doctrine and policy for our newest service. Finally, Dr. Bill LaPlante, the Senior Vice President and General Manager of MITRE National Security and a former SAF AQ. He oversees operation of both the National Security Engineering Center and the National Cybersecurity Federally Funded Research and Development Center. So thanks to everyone for joining us in this important discussion. And with that, I'd like to first extend the opportunity to Dr. LaPlante to offer some opening remarks, followed by Lieutenant General Nahum, Hynote, and LaCorey. So, Bill, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dave, and, and thanks again for uh, for having an opportunity to be on this great panel. Um, this is this idea of doing effects-based cost analysis. It's one of those ideas that is stunningly um, obvious. At the same time, we don't nearly we hardly ever do it, and I think it's been a very great concept to be put forward in this paper. Um, it has multiple reasons why this is this is important. Now, obviously, when you come from an acquisition perspective, we get it that we get judged appropriately so by the the classic cost metrics that General Deptula mentioned. If it's R&D, if you're developing an R&D, a new system, it's gonna be the R&D money. When you're in production, it's gonna be what's called the APUC, average procurement unit cost, and sustainment, which is typically 60, 70% of the cost for, for sustainment. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, that really is only one way to look at the benefit of these systems. And in fact, we get overly consumed at times in the system by focusing on those individual elements on the actual aircraft, for example, and not seeing the effect. And when you look at the effect, it gives you a very different view on what are the key capabilities. It is something we know how to do and we know how to manage it. We have done it before. So this is a very important concept because we don't, we don't win by the individual weapon or the individual platform, we win by the effect. So I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Dave. Joe Neho. Uh, well, sir, just a couple things. So it's uh, th thank you so much for having me on board. It's uh, it's great to be uh, here and have this discussion today. Uh, and I will say that we do, um, and I don't want to steal any thunder from, uh, from General Hino and certainly General Corey with the Space Force, but I would say we do talk a lot about effects in the strategy piece. The problem with what translates out of that is a lot of platforms because when, when you live in this town, certainly when you live in my world here in the eight, um, platforms are what what people in this town want to discuss. Uh, not only new platforms we bring on, but the old platforms and how long we're going to keep them and how long we're going to uh, uh, keep bases operating, things like that. So it does devolve into a platform discussion. But that being said, there is certainly the conversation on the effects and where we need to go as an Air Force in, in the backdrop that, that's happening continuously. With that, I'll turn it over to Q, because I think you know, one thing we did very well as we split the five and the eight, it allowed me as the eight to kind of stay in the trenches and work some of these difficult issues and bring, bring it on new platforms and new capabilities. But it also cleaned up the environment for Q to work, look at where the Air Force is actually going uh, in the advent of AFWIC and certainly uh, consolidating the A5 under a, a single directorate. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. So General Attila, thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to be part of the panel, and I'm really looking forward to this year's Air and Space Conference, and even though it's going to be different with the pandemic and we're going to be coming at you virtually, uh, we think that it offers a great opportunity for, uh, for all of our airmen to participate uh, and be able to see what really happens in the Air and Space Conference, and so hopefully we can take advantage of the situation and make it make it work well. It's great to see uh, Dr. LaPlante and uh, my, my, uh, my partner in crime, uh, General Nahum. Uh, we, we, we end up uh, uh, partnering in all sorts of uh, ventures, uh, both on this side of the river and on the other side. And, uh, and, and actually the partnership that he talks about is so important. 
And of course, this year, we want to say a huge congratulations to the Space Force and a special congratulations to my good friend, Bill LaCorey, uh, who just took over as the uh, as as a very big job in the uh, in the Space Force is the S589. So congrats, Bill. And uh, really looking forward to working with you uh, it, as we uh, make this this entire uh, relationship work. So uh, the, the the paper identifies something that uh, that is key, and I totally agree with Dr. Laplan about how it ought to be obvious. That of course we're talking effects, but it's not so obvious because so many of the business practices, and I use that term intentionally, the business practices inside of our service and inside of the department writ large, are, uh, are they come from industry, they come from com the commercial sector. And so some of the terms of reference kind of get turned on their head when we're talking about the military. A good example would be return on investment. Uh, pretty easy to measure that in the financial sense. Uh, much more difficult to measure that in a military value sense. And as an example, with a, a weapon system that never gets used but produces a, a high deterrent value, you might say the, the uh, uh, a type of missile or something like that, is that a, a val does that give you high return on investment? And I would I would argue, of course it does. But it, in another sense, it's staying in place. It's never being expended. So you, you have a very difficult time putting a number on that as well. And uh, uh, Dr. LaPlante mentioned cost of ownership, and that's a really important term of art for us as we think about the model that so many of our weapon systems follow, where the per unit cost is actually somewhat low uh, compared to the, the value of it, but the sustainment cost over time is actually significantly higher than the per unit cost. And with that, we have to, uh, to consider that, uh, that the model of profitability for some of our industry partners might actually be working against modernization, i.e. it's more profitable to sustain the old stuff than to design the new stuff. We certainly don't want to incentivize that. And so we're talking about things to, to get after the new regarding that. Fully burdened cost is another one. And I think this is the one that's probably the most interesting after reading the paper, is thinking about you, uh, General Attila, you mentioned mosaic warfare, you mentioned combat cloud, all of the parts of the battle network that have to come together to produce that effect. And how do you uh, I judge the cost of that? Maybe you judge the cost of an entire kill chain and compare it to other kill chains. And certainly we've seen analyses that get after that to a degree, but I've never seen one that, would, that really struggled with this idea of fully burdened cost across the entire kill chain, if you, if you call it find, fix, track, target, engage, the cells, you, you, you know, how, how do you measure that fully burdened cost? And I hope that's something we can explore as we get a chance to go into the panel. Thank you. General LaCorey. Well, sir, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you and AFA for the opportunity to participate in this year's virtual conference. It's a, it's a real honor and a treat to uh, be on a panel with uh, these panelists here. Um, it, it's uh, quite the group and a, and a good group to talk about this topic, a topic which is incredibly timely as we think about um, budgets con continuing to get tighter. Um, and now as, as that budget gets tighter, adding another military service into the mix with the United States Space Force. Um, and so I, I found it interesting. I think uh, General Nahum did a great job of highlighting that we often talk about effects-based um, um, strategies. It's harder as we move into budgeting uh, because everybody wants to focus on a particular widget. Um, and so I think it will be a, a challenge for us, but one that we need to tackle is how do we transition that effects-based discussion out of the strategy world and into the resourcing world? Uh, and look forward to the, uh, the questions and the dialogue today. Thank you again. Well, very good. Thank you all, gentlemen, for your uh, insights uh, on the uh, topic. So let's uh, dig into it in a, in a little bit more uh, detail. Um, General Hynot, let me uh, uh, pitch the first uh, uh, question uh, to you. Uh, and obviously, you've got great experience as an aerospace professional in the operational world, um, as well as experience developing the Air Force's future force design uh, efforts at the uh, Air Force uh, Warfighting Integration Capability. 
Um, could you explain what it means as we uh, seek to better harness the attributes of fifth generation technology uh, and explore the potential of battle networks, as well as the notion of disaggregated uh, operations? Um, so you take a first shot at it, and then I'd like to hear from uh, Dave, Bill, and Bill as, uh, as well. Thank you. It's a great question. And, uh, and certainly one of the things we see when we explore all domain operations is we are looking at the ability to generate, to transfer and act on information. And so that's where you get the battle network. And uh, in, in fact, uh, I think that as we think about cost per effect, the battle network is a very important piece of this. It may be the piece that is the differentiator between the cost per effect of different platforms. And, and as uh, General Nahum said, and he's so right, it's so easy for us to get uh, pulled in to talk about the, the, the weapon or the platform, but we really need to think of it in aggregate. And this is the, the whole point of the mosaic work that you all have done, is bringing together parts of the picture uh, to the point where there's a holistic picture at the end when they're all tied together. And in our case, we're tying it together by the flow of information. And so somehow we have to think about how information is generated, how it's transferred and how it's used. And then what's the cost of that as you go forward? So as an example, you use the Desert Storm uh, model and uh, you, you know and, we, and, and that I flew the F-117 and uh, we thought a lot about targeting and things like that. And uh, in that particular model, uh, we mostly hit fixed targets. Uh, that, that was what we knew how to do. And there was an entire overhead uh, imagery collection system that, uh, that helped us understand what was out there. There was an entire uh, analysis part of the intelligence community that took the targets and, and figured out what they did and where the best aim points would be. And if we were going to fully burden the cost out, we would think about that. And then we think about today how the majority of our targets certainly the targets that we care about, the ones that are either most lethal against us or more, most effective when we hit them, the majority of them are going to be moving. Uh, they're, they're mobile. And, and so the, it used to be that we might could count on a single platform to generate the target, uh, to find the target, to generate the target coordinates and act on the target. Sometimes we see that, but generally when we think about the scale that you need to be able to win, in, uh, in, in a strategic environment where we have great power competition, you're not gonna be able to rely on single platforms to do the entire kill chain. So you have to knit them all together. And this idea of figuring out the cost of that, I think has got to really be part of the, uh, of the debate that happens within the building. And, uh, and as an example, we clearly are going to see a, uh, a set of kill chains where the Air Force and the Space Force come together to find the targets, to generate the information as close to the edge as possible, so that maybe you don't have to rely as much on the processing, exploitation, and dissemination process back in the CONUS, but you're using machine learning algorithms up front to be able to generate as much knowledge as possible, transfer that knowledge through every command node to the right shooter, and be able to connect those kill chains. If you can do that, certainly you have the potential to, to prevail. And then I think that it's, it's gonna be a, 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 an incredibly interesting process to think about what the cost of those skill chains are. And, uh, and I would argue that we probably have a pretty good, uh, uh, I think we've got a pretty good argument to make that, uh, that the kill chains that involve a lot of air and space platforms uh, could possibly be fairly cheap in comparison to the fully burdened cost of the alternatives. And uh, in, in any case, I'm looking forward to that analysis. Very good. Joe Nahum, any comments? Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, a former senior leader of Air Force used to say that, uh, you know, here we are with, with, with you know, our advanced battle management system, our, our joint all domain command and control. We're trying to build a highway to connect uh, our, our services and we're trying to, uh, get money to build this highway uh, and not so much the trucks that go on the highway. The problem is here in DC, it's a town that likes trucks, but not so much highways. Uh, and it's hard, to, it's hard to talk about that. I'll tell you one thing too, is we find, and Q and I find this, we go across the river all the time too. When we start, start telling a story why airplane X and airplane Y, even though these are 
fairly new airplanes can't share data, there's a little bit of disbelief. Uh, so I think it's, 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 it's telling that story of where we are and how we share information and where we need to go. And it's not necessarily the, the, the attractive thing to do, the attractive thing to invest money on. Uh, and, we, and we do certainly spend a lot of time convincing. You know, Q talks so well about the kill chain. There's that high-end kill chain we got to think about. But the other part, and uh, as I think about on the eight sides too, is there's not just a high-end kill chain we got to think about, but there's what I call an affordable capacity because the U.S. Air Force is asked to do a lot of missions around the world that aren't necessarily going to war uh, against a peer adversary, uh, whether it's homeland defense or a low intensity conflict, or you, you name the mission that our Air Force is involved with. We got to find out what that affordable capacity looks like, and that's going to need to be networked just like a high end kill chain is going to be networked as well. Uh, with that, sir, I'll turn it over to Bill. General LaCorey, how does, uh, how does this discussion look like from uh, the Space Force's perspective? Yes, sir. I, I, I think very, very similar. I, you know, both Dave and Clint uh, highlighted. Um, the need to be able to connect and share and, and you know, look no further than last week's uh, advanced battle management system on ramp uh, number two uh, to see some of the things that were proven out, um, but also that we had some things that we didn't necessarily accomplish. And that's really what we want to be able to do. We want to press the test in demos, uh, much like that one in future demos, uh, to where you don't meet all of your goals. You want to set some big audacious goals out there and we'll learn uh, from the areas where we had success, but we'll learn as much, if not more in the areas where we didn't have success. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the unified data library, which is something that we had been working uh, in Air Force Space Command prior to the service being established. Uh, and now with the Space Force, we continue to work with that and, and have put that forward to be the data one component uh, of ABMS. A key player in that ABMS on-ramp demo uh, last week, uh, I think connecting about 60 plus uh, different uh, sensors and shooters uh, and command centers uh, to enable some of these things. And so the trick for us will be to take what we learn and experience in um, demos or war games, uh, much like that, and translate that into our analysis for supporting budgets as we go forward and identifying which of those pieces were critical um, to not just moving a piece of data from A to B, but what did that enable us to do by, by connecting and sharing that data? Very good. Dr. LeBlanc? Yeah, I would add a, another piece that's important here that sometimes doesn't get the attention. Clearly effects-based ideally should be considered right up front at the beginning of new concepts and family of systems. And is obviously cons considered by the warfighter, as my gentlemen and colleagues on this panel obviously know. What we often see, though, and this is another way of saying that how Washington works, but it's really when the acquisition system gets its job to do, necessarily so, perhaps, mm -hmm. we've organized it by PEO tanker, PEO fighter bomber, PEO this, right, for good reason. And so the, it's like the, the effects could disappear from the capability development side of the enterprise, the side that let's say AQ ran. And it's not because we don't have very smart PEOs or great PEOs. It's just that that, that goes into the background. Yet really where it needs to go, in my opinion, and I think in the cases where it seems to really work is to have a constant trade across these kill chains for capability where the warfighter can be constantly weighing in, the acquisition folks can be modifying as they learn. And we are trading but with the metric being on the effect. We'll always need to be able to say how much an airplane costs. But you, if we could track more, get more of the thinking into tracking how the effect is developing, how much it's costing, you get so much other benefit. Another sidebar benefit you get is cyber vulnerability often happens via the kill chain. So if we, we want the PEO for tanker, as they do, to be thinking about how do I connect to everybody else from a cyber perspective? So this horizontal aspect has multiple uh, ad advantages beyond the war fighting clearly advantage or the initial upfront piece. Over. Oh, Dr. DeBucco, as you're speaking, I'm thinking to myself, boy, I sure hope that he's willing to go back and entertain uh, accepting another high position inside the Department of Defense to be able to make what you just said reality in terms of what goes on inside the building. Are you willing to commit to that, 
I'm, I'm not the decision maker. I have a family that all my kids <laughs> and my wife are, are, have more stars than I do. But Thank you very kid. much. Very kind. Thank you. No, I think your, your comments are spot on. Uh, now, uh, for everybody, uh, we, we tend to talk about JADC2 and ABMS. They're a futuristic topic. Um, however, I'd argue that we've been living in this world for quite some time, given the capabilities afforded by a robust space-based ISR communications architecture. Um, aircraft like the B-2, the F-22, and F-35, as well as sensor shooters like the MQ-9. These systems are information machines first and foremost. I, I forgot which one of you already said it, but I, it was Abu and Nahum uh, that, you know, we, we, we built a couple airplanes over the last few decades that couldn't even talk to each other. Uh, but I think the mindset is changing uh, and people understand that, uh, that these are information machines first and who is going to win and what is going to be the next big thing. It's gonna be the ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information and how we can do that. Um, but all these systems are designed to understand the battle space to ensure that they can be in the right place, right time uh, to maximize desired results and uh, reduce uh, vulnerabilities. Um, what have they taught us about the next generation capabilities that we seek to develop? Um, and how will these existing systems advance to ensure that we actually get to a vision of a combat cloud or a net mesh or whatever you'd like to call it, uh, but an enterprise that will fully realize the potential of their capabilities. Q, why don't we go in the same order, make it simple. Okay, uh, boy, I tell you what, there's a lot there. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, is is to uh, reiterate what you said about Dr. Oplant, and uh, and to say how much I agree with him when he's talking about this idea that you have to, and, and I think this will be uh, interesting to your audience here, is that there's a big move inside of uh, of of certainly the department writ large, on. Uh, there was a time when I think that, you know, the warfighter owned the requirements and then you kick it over the transom to acquisition and they use the KPPs, key performance parameters, and they build to it. And, you know, the, the warfighter requires and the AQ acquires, and I've heard that before and all that. But it, we find that that stovepiped, uh, uh, you, you know, standard is is not very helpful in today's world. And so one of the things that we have, uh, that we have gravitated toward, and I think it, 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 it's fully uh, uh, explained you know, by uh, Dr. LaPant, there was this idea of capability development, which is an iterative process. It's, uh, it's something that we, uh, we, we never get a chance to throw in anything over the transom and forget about it. Uh, what, we're, what we're always doing is, is iterating on the, uh, on the equipment and then the conceptual side of how you use the equipment and then how the equipment fits into an overall design. And this is why some, one of the more exciting forums that we have right now inside of, uh, of certainly the Air Force is the Capability Development Council, uh, where we bring in AQ and we bring in the major command. So the warfighters and the acquisition folks are talking to each other. And I gotta tell you, I learn a lot from, uh, from my acquisition counterparts in those meetings. I, I, I think they learn a lot from the, the warfighter discussions that we have. And that gets directly into this idea of command and control. Because what we are seeing, and, and Bill talked about the, uh, the advanced battle management system on ramp that happened last week. And uh, I got a chance to attend, and it was a fantastic uh, exercise and set of experiments. I learned an incredible amount. And one of the things I saw is that we are getting closer and closer to uh, to having the technology that you mentioned in Combat Cloud, being able to have what seems like seamless uh, transfer of information across multiple platforms, multiple systems throughout kill chains. And the interesting thing to me is what that enables from a, uh, a command and control, maybe more of a conceptual point of view. And I can only imagine what you would have done back in Desert Storm with some of the technologies that we're seeing play out today and how, uh, how we might have been able to be so much more agile and, uh, and so much more effective in, uh, in our communication and 
and, and it, it, one of the interesting things that I just think that the whole department is going to have to wrestle with is if we have the capability to be able to transfer this information like we are, what does that mean for the future of command and control? And would you be willing, assuming that uh, the, the frontline warfighter has your intent, has as good or better understanding of the situation as you do back in your headquarters, would you be willing to, to execute true mission command using these technological systems? And how would you do that across domains? Maybe the component structure that we have grown used to in the Joint Task Force is, uh, is not necessarily what you'd want to do when you kick command to the front and you allow the speed and the scale to develop using this technology. And so there's a fascinating conceptual world as we develop these technologies, which is why going back to what I was saying about capability development, it's so important to be iterative with it because clearly the technology can drive conceptual options and then the concepts end up driving the requirements for technology. And there's a virtuous cycle. There's also a negative cycle too, if you don't bring them together. And so what we're seeing is that it's so important to be able to to do that and have the warfighter and the acquirer and working closely with our industry partners to be able to make that iteration work. Well said, Joe Nahum. Uh, you know, the one thing I'll add to what Q said is, um, is, uh, is simply as data standards. You know, as we, as we look forward to new platforms coming on and new capabilities, we have to build a, a single data standard so we can take advantage of the information right away without having to go back and retrofit with gateways and other kind of filters and pods and things like that we have to do now. Uh, there's, there's too much capability in the platforms you're putting out right now and our inability to share the data and the information. Uh, and, and you take an airplane like the F-35, the inability to share that information at machine speeds on the battlefield right now is, is a shame. And we need to get to that point. And then as new platforms come on, they have to come out with standard, just like if you were building a new cell phone, you would expect it to be, be able to connect to the net right away. Uh, and that, it has to be that same standard for what we're bringing to the service. Very good, General LaCorey. I, I would echo exactly what General Nahum just said. And um, I, I would highlight it this way. You know, I think you were um, spot on, sir, as you started by saying, you know, we've, we've had systems that are out there to provide um, the ISR needed for our strike platforms and, and other systems, and, and we should learn from those. But I think it was General Nahum's example where he highlighted a few of our aircraft that can't talk to each other. Um, every dollar that we spend on a pod to translate from one data standard to another is a dollar we can't spend on actual capability um, out there. And so data standards is going to be a huge, uh, huge deal to us going forward. You know, um, a lot of our platforms have uh, started to embrace the universal command and control interface. I think that's one of the things that's been key. UCI has been key to the success on the ABMS front. Um, we'll need to evolve. There will be new capabilities that will come online that, that may not fit right into the current UCI uh, standards, and we may have to evolve those. And, and the willingness to do that will only make us better going forward. Very good. Dr. LaPlante, let me switch the subject just a little bit here for you. Um, could you please offer your insights on the way um, assessments of systems are currently ongoing? You mentioned this just a little bit in passing previously. Um, and, and knowing what you know now, after your time as the Air Force AQ, how would you design cost assessment metrics um, if you were given a, a clean sheet to uh, start over? Yeah, I would. Well, I would. You'd have, you have to keep cost per platform, I get it, and APUC for weapons, uh, I get that. But what I think should be done, and looking backward, is I think beginning at, at the start of a concept, going through with the AOA phase, and I'm sorry for using those three letters, AOA, that you would develop the effects-based modeling that would live and breathe as the, as the family of systems gets put into the, the acquisition and the requirement system for this constant trade I talked about. You would have this living and breathing uh, modeling and sim that would be fed with uh, the developments as we prototype this, as we prototype the material AFWIC results, and it would actually help us validate things like campaign models. We don't build build budgets with things like campaign models. So that's what I would do. The other piece of this, David, is um, on the outside, 
I just wrapped up some work for the Defense Science Board where we looked at campaign analysis. And we found was that in the department, and maybe this isn't a surprise to some, there is a little, uh, there, are, there are people that really rely on campaign analysis, which is often effects-based. There are others that either don't, it doesn't have credibility to them or they don't understand it. And particularly senior decision makers who may not have a lot of time. So that would be another piece would be to tie together the campaign analysis as these living and breathing effects chains are moving through the system. And I would make sure that that campaign analysis, and this is hard, adds to it the multi-domain effects, the cyber effects in space. That's what we need. And, it, and, and when this digital engineering age, we can tie it to the development of the systems as we move along. But you would have a constant model fed with data of the kill chain. So that if we know we're, we're getting this performance out of the weapon, so we can relax this requirement over here on another part of the kill chain. Wouldn't that be great? That's the holy grail from my perspective, over. Well, once again, I need to get you back into the senior level, DOD level, so you can impose those magnificent ideas if I do say so myself. Um, let me follow up, uh, Bill, if I could, on a program that's near and dear to your heart, um, one that you had a, a hand in, and that's the B-21. Um, from conversations that I've had with you and others, the Department of Defense and the uh, Air Force harness thinking far more in line with our cost per effect concept. Could, could you elaborate to the degree that you can on uh, how you did that? Yeah, and I, and I don't take credit for any, and the, this part of it, but really the, it goes back to roughly the 2010 timeframe before I served as AQ when actually uh, Secretary uh, at the time Gates told the Air Force and told the building basically to go back and take a look about, do we need a new bomber? What is this thing really gonna be? And as many know, the year of 2010 was spent with a lot of family of systems analysis a lot across all levels of classification that looked at the future of long range strike. It looked at platforms, manned unmanned, penetrating, non-penetrating, kinetic, non-kinetic, ISR, EW, things we can't talk about here, but from the kill chain perspective. And it shows that we could do it. And this was not the Air Force only. It was all services. It was driven from the top, Secretary Gates. And at the time, the ATNL was Secretary Ash Carter. The result of all of that was in February of 2011, a three or four page classified document was signed out by SECDEF. That was the, this is what we need for the new bomber at the time called LRSB. And those it, what those came up with was the basic specs have held up over time. And any time when I served from 2013 to 2016, we were explaining the program on the Hill, going to a skeptic. They'd say, well, why do we need a bomber, man bomber? Why don't we look at a bunch of unmanned things with carry you know, uh, cruise missiles? We say, well, we've, that's been looked at. Let me show you the full effects. And it was living and breathing with the program. It turned out that the first program manager for, for the B-21 for five years a gentleman by the name of Colonel Tim Woods. Tim was the executive secretary for Secretary Gates and Carter on that family of systems study in 2010. So up through 2015, that same program manager was able to explain across all these effects, why we were doing what we were doing. And it was incredible, um, in incredible just, just uh, validation to anybody who was a skeptic that we were not just thinking about the bomber in isolation. And so for me, I'm like, hey, we've done it before as a building. Why don't we do this on other things? Yeah. And so that to me shows it can be done. Well, very good. Thanks for that insight. Um, General LaCorey, um, while many of our space-based warfighting capabilities are uh, highly classified, um, how do you try and explain to stakeholders in the Department of Defense or on Capitol Hill and elsewhere the notion of front-end effects-based value and cost assessment for our space-based family of systems? Sure, yes sir, so great question. And I think it, it really starts with first making sure that everyone clearly understands that, that space is no longer just a domain that supports operations in other domains, um, but it's a domain uh, where the United States Space Force has a responsibility to protect and defend um, our national assets uh, in space. Um, we can help that certainly by working to avoid overclassification uh, of systems. I, I, uh, Clint may very well remember, uh, as he and I were stationed at the weapons school together, uh, conversations where I had systems I couldn't tell him about, he couldn't tell me about his systems, and, and all that does is hamper the ability to integrate and to do these types of effects-based 
operations that we discuss, or at least to do them effectively. Um, and so we need to work on that. You know, there's no reason in our domain that we can't keep the, the higher level what a particular capability is at a lower classification level, if not unclassified, and then protect the technical details that we need to, much like we do in other domains. We, we know that uh, Clint uh, flew the F-117. We don't have to know the details uh, of the technical specs that would have been in the classified realm. We need to do the same on our side uh, to enable those conversations. I think the other thing that um, we need to leverage, in it, and I don't think it's isolated to just the Space Force, but uh, digital engineering, I think, offers us um, uh, a lot of potential in that um, we can take digital models and simulations and do trade-off analysis um, on computers and on those digital models before we actually bend metal and build expensive satellites. Uh, and all the better if we can do that comparison uh, across multiple domains. So not just on a particular space system, but how does that space system connect to an air system or a land system? Uh, and if all of that is done in the digital environment, uh, we can help inform those costs and, and trade-off discussions uh, before we ever get into them and before we get into actually bending metal on any of our expensive systems. Very good. Now we've got four minutes left. So in a rapid fire round, I'd like to give each of you the opportunity to add any thoughts that you'd like to share. What are we missing? Are there different angles that should be considered? And what's the cost of not embracing a new approach? So let's start with Q. Well, thank you for this opportunity. The, uh, the one thing I'd say that's mentioned in the paper, we haven't talked about it too much yet, is the idea of the pass-through. Uh, it, it, it's an important part of this discussion. Uh, it makes it look like the Department of the Air Force is getting more money than it actually is. I think it obscures debate about defense spending, and it gets into this idea of how hard it is to compare across services and it's a and it's a a a part of our reality that uh, that that whose time has passed. Dave Nail. Yeah, it's good to have a Q talk about uh, money stuff. It helps me out. So uh, <laughs> I was say the last thing, sir. Um, you know, we're not going to fight alone as an Air Force. When we talk about data standards. We talk about interoperability and pulling things together. We have to we have to think exportability from the onset. We have to think about our coalition partners. And that's certainly from the warfighter perspective, that always seems to be the biggest challenge when we actually have to go fight is how we're going to integrate our partners. And we don't seem to do a good job at the onset with a lot of these capabilities. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Very good. General LaCorey. So, sir, I was going to beg your forgiveness and, and do two items to wrap up. But General Nahum just hit the first one. Obviously, international partners and doing that from the beginning is important. I think the other one that we didn't really talk about today but also comes into play for us is leveraging agile software development wherever we can. Getting those operators, developers, and testers together from the very beginning to work against a problem set that the operators have delivering some interim capability faster and then iterating on that as technology allows and as the threat evolves, um, working together on that, I think will help us go a long way as well. Dr. LaPlante. Just to, just to add to what General Corey said, one thing, if we could have the operator has to stay driving this problem from the kill chain perspective. In software acquisition, as General Corey just said, where you're getting the developer and the, and the uh, user together regularly. Well, the user for our, for our effects is the warfighter. They need to be regularly getting together with the kill chain of the, those of us developing the kill chain and give us that, that leadership. We can be technical experts in my community, but we're not kill chain experts. The warfighter is a kill chain expert. That's why that magic has to stay there and has to be continuous. Well, very good. We've come to the end of this special Aerospace Nation. And gentlemen, it truly was an honor to host you all today at AFA's Virtual Aerospace and Cyber Conference. And we thank you for all that you continue to do to defend our nation. And thanks to all of you participants out there who tuned in to watch this panel on an effects-based approach to force structure. Please be sure to check out AFA's daily report the latest coverage on our virtual airspace and cyber conference and have a great aerospace power kind of day.